Hi, I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts, Criminal, by Phoebe Judge. And episode 36 was actually set here in Austin, Texas. They were talking about the Treaty Oak that is downtown just off of Baylor Street. And the sad part was I had never heard of it before. And I live here in Austin. As soon as the episode finished, I wanted to see it for myself because they said this tree was over 50 feet tall, over 125 feet in diameter. I mean, that's a heck of a tree. So I thought, why not take you along with me and tell you a little bit about this tree and what makes it so special. So welcome to the Treaty Oak here in Austin, Texas. The first thing to know about this tree is that it is old, very old. It's over 500 years old, in fact. This is a southern live oak, and it was actually part of 14 trees that were all in a grove together that dates back to Native American times. The Comanche and the Tonkawa tribes would actually meet under this tree to discuss war and peace parties, or treaties, which is giving this tree its namesake of the Treaty Oak. It is believed that the women of these tribes would actually brew tea from its leaves and drink it under the full moon in the hopes that it would bring their warriors home safely. So this is actually where Stephen F. Austin lore comes into play. Any of you who are familiar with Texas history might remember that Stephen F. Austin is referred to as the father of Texas because at the young age of 24, he led 300 families, known as the Old 300, the 300 miles from Louisiana to what is now known as San Antonio, Texas, and set up a colony. The reason Stephen F. Austin came to this tree is he brought his Austin colony to meet with Native Americans to set up boundary lines when a local judge and two children were killed during raids. By 1927, this was the only tree that remained of the original 14. Why? Austin was expanding and no one had time to take care of all the trees so eventually they just got cut down like many others in the area. Now this lone survivor actually earned his reputation of being the most perfect specimen of any living tree and was actually put in the Hall of Fame. So here's a picture of what it looked like back in the 1920s. The reason the Caldwell name is on here is that Walter Caldwell was a Texas Ranger that bought the land the tree sits on. It remained in his family for about 50 years, but unfortunately taxes were cruel. And so one of the widows of a Caldwell put the land up for sale for about $7,000. People were begging the Texas legislator to buy this piece of historic land, but they refused. The city of Austin ended up buying the land for $1,000. And so it has remained here ever since. But the story doesn't end here. In fact, the tree almost ended here. It all happened in March of 1989. First it appeared as just dead grass nearby the tree, but months later residents were reporting oak wilt. Now this is common with trees such as these, where the leaves start to wilt and the Spanish moss that lives on the tree starts to die from a fungus and eventually kills the entire tree. Luckily, oak wilt can be prevented. But what happened to this tree could not. Soil samples showed that the tree had been poisoned with a specific compound made to kill everything but pine trees. So this was done on purpose. It couldn't have been an accident because just a few ounces of this herbicide can kill a big tree. And this person had dumped over a gallon. Someone wanted the treaty oak dead. The first question I had was, is there a way to cure something that potent with a tree? And the problem was, is at the time, there wasn't. No one had been able to stop it before. The trees always died. So basically how this herbicide works is that it's water activated, so it's able to move up through the tree into the branches and sticks in the leaves. The leaves can't photosynthesize, so the tree can't make any energy, it can't eat. So the tree, trying to save itself, sheds the leaves and grows new ones that have the herbicide within them. And so basically, it's just a constant cycle of shedding leaves, but that uses energy that it doesn't have. It's not getting. Bottom line is that this tree will shed itself to death trying to survive, because once you run out of energy, you die. Different departments pulled together a reward of $11,000 for any information for who hurt the tree. All the while, city forester John Gadritis, only 26 years old I might add, had to figure out how to save the tree. However, the city of Austin had hope. This hope and apparent outrage at the tree poisoning got John to be interviewed by huge news networks and even by Miss Barbara Walters herself. 
The residents showed their respects by bringing the tree humble offerings such as cards, letters, bottles of Tums, and even some chicken noodle soup. The most prominent person who wanted to help was none other than Austin resident Ross Perot. Yes, that same billionaire who ran for president against Bush and Clinton in 1992. But instead of soup, he gave a blank check. He said, do whatever you have to do and send me the bill. 22 experts came together to make a plan about the tree. Testing had to be done, so most of the $100,000 that Perot provided was spent on testing the soil of the tree. But as the testing continued, the tree kept shedding. Austin police, on the other hand, were looking at a man named Paul Cullen. He worked at a farm supply store that sold that very herbicide. Worse, someone had seen two containers of the stuff in the back of his truck. The witness had received rides home with Paul and knew he was in love with one of the counselors at the methadone clinic they both went to. The counselor, however, didn't love him back. So, of course, the most obvious answer was to go grab a black arts book from the library in search of a love spell. He created a magic circle to kill the love that his counselor had for someone else. But after some coaxing and the witness wearing a wire, he admitted to what he did and was arrested. Nine years for a second degree felony criminal mischief charge and a thousand dollar fine. He almost got a life sentence because he had been charged with a robbery before. This was also a reason that he said in court of why he poisoned the tree, to get back at Texas for putting him in jail. By the time Paul went to jail, a third of the tree was dead. John and his team were still working hard to save the rest of the tree, when suddenly, it clicked. The tree shedding was using up energy, so they decided to just replenish that lost energy with a giant tree ivy made of sugar. Cuttings of twigs were actually sent off to try and grow new trees, and one actually did. Like crazy. They planted the new tree next to the old tree to nurse it back to health, until eventually those trees would fuse together and feed each other. It worked. The baby trees saved the mama tree. Because in 1997, it produced its first acorns since the poisoning. Finally, the tree could live another hundred years. Although the tree was saved, Paul Colin was not. He only served three years when he died in California at the age of 57 in 2001. So I want you to tell me in the comments, do you think that justice was served? Do you think that the punishment was harsh enough for someone who did so much damage to such a beautiful tree that is a piece of Austin's history? And please let me know if you like these history lessons. Maybe I'll do it again. Either way, I'm very happy to see that the tree is still here and alive and in my town. And it's so great that I can visit a piece of Austin history that struggled so hard to stick around. I hope you enjoyed, and either way, I will see you next week. Bye.